There is a pattern that shows up throughout nature called Voronoi cells. For example, the cellular pattern on the back of this giraffe, its cells consist of polygons whose boundaries are just comprised of straight lines. This is a dragonfly wing. Again, it consists of all of these polygons with straight lines. This even occurs in canopies where you might think, well, trees grow out in circular patterns. Nevertheless, the cells in these canopies form these polygons with approximately straight lines. The same is true in three dimensions if I blow bubbles into this cup of milk. What's formed is a cellular pattern within my glass. But the boundary of these bubbles is not spherical like you'd expect if there was only one bubble. When they're all clustered together, the boundaries form these straight planes. My favorite example for illustrating why this pattern occurs is with crystallization of some medium. Imagine you've got some two-dimensional medium and it's going to crystallize. Crystals tend to grow from random seed points, little impurities that cause crystals to grow. The crystallization spreads out from any individual seed, but there's only finite space, and so they bump into each other, and what you get is these Voronoi cells in the final result. If I just do the start of it, everything initially is growing out by larger and larger circles, until you start getting places like these ones, where the circles are bumping into each other, and that's where they start spreading out along a common line of contact. If I continue the animation, then they continue growing and those lines get longer until everything in my diagram is just lines. If you wish, you could emphasize those boundaries, those lines, and if I remove the color, a diagram like this is typically what we call a Voronoi cell diagram. But let's be a bit more precise. If I focus on just a couple of those points, what is the line exactly that's occurring between them? Then the big idea is these points are equal distance to this central line. As they're spreading, this point of intersection is precisely where they first meet. But all the way along the line, it's equal distance to the point. So playing the animation, the time of which the cells hit the line is the same on both sides of the line. This line represents this line of equal distance between the two initial seed points. This was for crystallization of a cell, but you can imagine it for an organism that's growing, like that dragonfly that's growing its wing. Whenever you have this sort of somewhat random set of seed points, then the growth from those seed points is gonna create these Voronoi diagrams, all comprised of straight lines. If I move my seed points around, then you can get all sorts of different types of Voronoi diagrams and a cool animation like this one. One of the most infamous examples of using Voronoi cells to actually solve something occurred in the 1850s when there was a cholera epidemic in London. And Jon Snow, a, a physician in London, not Game of Thrones, discovered something kind of interesting. He noticed that there was a water pump on the map. And in fact, there were many water pumps in London. But when you try to map out which water pump is closest, well, he came up with a map that looks something like this. This region was the portion of London that was all closest to this one pump. And then you'll notice in the map, there's, there's all these stacked lines. Those stacked lines represented deaths to cholera. And you'll notice how those are largely constrained within that geographic area. And so Jon Snow used this evidence to help support the theory that cholera was a waterborne transmission. And in effect, this is a type of Voronoi cell. It's this particular cell that has the majority of these cholera outbreaks. And because it's associated with a single water source, then that's good evidence that cholera is waterborne. Another great application of Voronoi cells is something called the greatest circle problem. Imagine you've got a city block and the points represent, oh, I don't know, some established business like a supermarket. If you're a competitor, you wanna come into this city, you wanna build a new supermarket, where should you put it? Well, you wanna put it somewhere where you can get the most number of people who think your supermarket is closer than the other ones. This turns out to be equivalent to saying, where is the largest circle that I can put in this city that avoids the existing nodes? For example, here's a circle. It's certainly not the largest one because I can imagine kind of blowing it up until it finally hits one of the other supermarkets. So maybe I should put my new supermarket in the middle of that circle. 
well, it turns out there's many possible circles that you can put around here. Which of those is the best one? Eyeballing it, I think it's this one. I think this is where they should put it in, but how could I tell that exactly? Now let me put up the Voronoi diagram and you'll notice what's happened here. The center point of that conjectured biggest circle aligns exactly with the vertex of a Voronoi diagram. And in fact, this is always the case. The maximum circles are always going to occur on either the vertices of a Voronoi diagram or it could be one of the edges of the Voronoi diagram where it intersects the boundary of your region. Indeed, if you are on a vertex, this is equal distance to those three closest points. Because on each of the lines that are incident to this point, they are representing equality between two of the points. So the vertex is equality between all three. And if you stepped off the vertex, then you'd be closer to one of the three points than you otherwise needed to be. So the vertices give you the candidates for the largest possible circle. And then here's where the real computational magic comes in. Is yes, there's a bunch of different vertices here. I can plot uh, just some number of them. Unlike with no information, where you'd have to sort of check all infinitely many points. Now you just have a finite number of vertices to check. So go through, compute which of those allows for the largest circle, and now you've solved the greatest circle problem. Voronoi cells show up in so many applications that there's so many things I could tell you about. But the thing I really want to focus on today is a particular type of mathematical modeling problem. So going back to my example where the crystals are going to expand, and I've paused my animation partially through, I have a question. What portion of this space is crystallized? What fraction of the original space is crystallized? It's a function of time. As time increases, a higher and higher proportion will be crystallized. I'm going to show you a bit of kind of cool statistical modeling to be able to come up with a really nice function of time for the fraction that is covered. I have to have a few assumptions. Uh, in the diagram I've shown you, just for the sake of the animation, I only have a few points. I'm going to assume I have a very large number of points. I'm going to assume that they're sort of independent of each other. They're, they're like random seed places within the space. There's, there's no other constraints between the point. Except I'm going to demand this thing called equidistributed. And what equidistributed means is that if I look into any sub-portion of my original space, that the number of points within that space is the same for any other number of space. That is, there, there's no sort of like systematic bias going here where they're all sort of shoved into one corner. They're so-called equidistributed around the region. Okay, so what should I do? Well, let me first by just give some names to all of these points. I'll call them Q1, Q2, Q3. And what I want to imagine is, let's take some new points. So this is not one of my seeds, one of the starts of my crystallization. It's just some new point P. So we're going to focus on the distance between P and all of the Qs, but for the moment, let's just focus on the distance between P and Q1. Okay, the crystal of Q1 grows for a while, and it's going to create a little circle of radius R. So my question is, if P is thought of as a random point, what's the probability that it's inside the circle or not inside the circle? That is, I want to compute the probability that the distance between P and Q1 is less than R. Now, remember I said my illustration was poor. I'm assuming that the region is really large. And so I'm assuming that what I have illustrated here where my point is right near the boundary and so it sort of clips off and is in a full circle, I'm going to assume that that doesn't happen in a sufficiently large space. And so I can just say, well, the probability that a point is inside that is just the fraction of the area inside of the circle divided by everything. So pi r squared is the area of a circle, then divided by the total area of my big region. Okay, tiny little trick, if the probability of being less than or equal to r is this, the probability of being bigger than r is just 1 minus that. So 1 minus pi r squared divided by the area of the big region. So this was the probability that my random point P was at least a distance of R away from the Q1. But what if I ask the same thing for all of the different points? That is, let me imagine there's a similar circle of radius R around every single one of the points, and I'm trying to figure out the distance from P to every single one of those. And what I'm really interested in is the probability of the minimum distance being at least equal to the value of R. That is, my point P is going to be outside of the growing cells. If it's going to be outside of all of them, then the minimum distance to all of them needs to be bigger than whatever the, the radius of the circles is right now, which I'm calling R. Then for the computation, these are independent. Remember I said my seed points were independent? 
And so it's just the product of this n times. If there's n different seed points, it's that one minus pi r squared divided by the area. It's that to the power of n. The independence here was crucial to allow this computation just to be a pure multiplication. And notice that if we were talking about less than r, if we hadn't done that one minus trick, then we'd really have to worry about the fact that circles were overlapping. But this way that I've done it, I don't have to worry about it. It's just a pure multiplication. Okay, but now let's go back. If I really want to know the probability that it's inside one of these things, so the probability that the minimum distance is less than r, that the p is inside of one of these things, I just do another one minus. So it's one minus and then this n fold product of one minus pi r squared divided by the total area. Note that throughout this argument, I've been using approximately this allows me to get rid of issues like, for example, along the boundary, my assumption that this very large is going to come into play. It's not exact, it's a statistical model, but it's a good approximation. Now I want to clean up my formula a little bit, so I'm going to assume a couple other things. Remember how I mentioned that this was what we called equidistributed? What I mean by this is if you take any specific area, the number of points that's inside of this is just a multiple of the area, some lambda times the area that you have. And so basically it just means that the area and the number of points, that they're just sort of a linear relationship between them. So I'm going to plug that in, I'm going to get rid of the area, and I'm going to have lambda divided by n in its place. And now let's use the fact that we're taking a large sample where n is very large. You might well have seen this before. 1 minus something divided by n to the power of n when n is large. That is the limit definition of the exponential. And so in the limit as n goes to infinity, I get 1 minus the exponential of this negative lambda pi r squared. Final assumption I'm going to make is that I'm imagining the cellular growth is happening at sort of a constant velocity. That is, the radius of these spheres, it's a function of time, and specifically, it's the velocity times the time, that the radius is just vt. This assumes a constant cell growth where the cells are just growing based on just whatever perimeter they have access to. And they do so at this sort of constant velocity. So I'll replace with the r, I'll plug in with vt. This is going to give me v squared t squared. And so I have the final function. It's just a function of t that's all that's left. 1 minus e to the negative pi lambda v squared t squared. And by our construction, this just represented the probability that the point p was inside one of those crystals. Or in other words, the fraction of the total region that is crystallized at any point in time. You can plot this curve and, and you get this really nice graph that hopefully makes sense with what we're talking about. At the beginning, there's very slow growth because the crystals are really small. There's not a lot of new area to crystallize. In the middle, it gets really fast, but then near the end, there's so much crystallized, there's not a lot of remaining room to still be crystallized and it's slowed down at the end. And indeed, the graph of this function sort of matches kind of the behavior we're expecting, which is some evidence that the mathematical model we came up with is relatively reasonable. Now, Voronoi cells pop up in all sorts of different places, but one of the coolest places they show up is in neural networks. And for that, I'd like to turn to the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org. While Brilliant has thousands of courses in math, science, and computer science, I've been having a lot of fun going through their course on neural networks, and it's just a delight. Brilliant breaks down the big ideas in digestible chunks, building up complexity in layers so that by the time you've built up to say an entire neural network that predicts the shape of what you've drawn, you've understood every step along the way of how a neural network is built. Everything is really interactive and full of quick tests of your knowledge so that you can make sure that you're fully understanding. As a professor, I know that this kind of student-centered active learning is really effective for your learning, and that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet or click the link down in the description. And the first 200 of you to click that link are going to get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.